And good evening. We close out this historic and very difficult week live from Ukraine. Russia accelerating its assault in southern Ukraine, now taking control of Europe's nuclear power plant, the largest one on the continent. A fire erupting at the plant after it came under Russian shelling, causing panic around the world. But officials say it was extinguished and seems to have released no radiation. The new images, Ukrainians pushing themselves onto evacuation trains out of Kyiv today as more and more people there try and escape. Half a million of those who have fled since Russia's invasion are children. A member of Ukraine's parliament telling me today those who have stayed will fight for their country and their future. And in Russia, the Kremlin cracking down on its dissidents, vowing prison time for what they call misinformation and blocking Twitter and Facebook. Major media companies now cutting ties. Meanwhile, Ukraine's president continues his calls for global support. NBC News has just learned that the full U.S. Senate has invited to meet with him, has been invited to meet with him tomorrow via Zoom. Vice President Kamala Harris is also scheduled to travel to the region next week. Let's get right to Richard Engel, who leads us off again tonight. After President Vladimir Putin apparently misjudged Ukrainian resistance, he appears to be trying to make up for it with brute force, wiping out this neighborhood in Chernihiv. This is what's left of a school that officials in Zodomir say was hit by a Russian strike. And NATO now accuses Russia of using cluster bombs, indiscriminate weapons banned by many countries, though not Russia or the United States. Ukrainian civilians are paying a heavier price by the day as Russia's invasion grows more relentless and more reckless. With a chilling attack overnight on Europe's biggest nuclear plant, you can see Russian tracer fire in this black and white surveillance footage. Flames and flares pouring out of a building near the plant. Ukraine's President Zelensky calling it a night that could have stopped history. Speaking in Russian, warning, radiation does not know where the borders of your country are. Tonight, Russia has seized control of the plant. UN officials say none of the reactors was hit and that no radiation was released. Meanwhile, Russian forces are having success in the south. After taking Kherson, now firing on Odessa and surrounding and attacking Mariupol, where the mayor says they're running out of food. Russia's apparent aim to cut off Ukraine from the Black Sea. In the capital, Kiev, there's now an urgent scramble to escape. As Russian forces are getting closer to the city, people are streaming out of it. Parents are tethered to their children. They're taking their pets. They're taking their grandparents. And everyone is heading west. You're hearing the train announcements and the train whistles and these long lines of people climbing onto the tracks. It feels to me like another era. The most crazy feel when you hear how kids screaming, mothers screaming. It's so crazy that panic. You see how people are so afraid. It has been like this all day. There's a lot of confusion about where these trains are departing from. People had been waiting here on Platform 9. There was just an announcement a few moments ago that the train to the west is actually leaving from Platform 12. Now everyone is rushing there, and nobody wants to miss it. This is the, the push right up at the door. There's been some people dropping bags. We've seen people holding their babies up in the air as they're trying to cram as many people possible onto this train. A lot of families we spoke to said they decided this morning to pack up their house, come here to the station, and just head west. Oksana is taking her one-year-old. They're leaving her husband behind with no idea where they'll eventually end up. We're at war, she says. We have to get the children out. Oleksi, staying behind to fight, told us saying goodbye to his wife and son is the hardest moment of his life. Tom, Ukraine's President Zelensky today again called for a no-fly zone. He's been critical of the West for not doing more, but NATO ruled it out, just like the White House has done before. Tom. Richard Engel for us tonight. Richard, thank you for a more in-depth look at Russia seizing control of Europe's largest nuclear power plant. I want to bring in a senior fellow at the Council of Strategic Risks, Andrew Weber. He's also a former assistant secretary of defense for nuclear, chemical and biological defense. Andrew, thanks for joining Top Story tonight. A lot of people at home are, are going to be maybe a little afraid about this because this seems like such a major development in this war. The Russians now have control of Europe's largest nuclear power plant. What exactly does that mean for Europe and the rest of the world? And, and how bad could this be if, if the Russians don't know what they're doing? Well, it's a reckless attack. 
And it could be bad. Um, luckily, it doesn't seem that any of the reactors or the um, cooling systems were, were hit in the, the shelling and fire uh, from last firefight. Um, and it's unclear over, but they must be relying on the uh, Ukrainian reactor staff who are in a terrible, terrible situation. I mean, they're almost uh, in a hostage situation, but I'm sure they will, given the chance, if given the chance, they will act uh, responsibly and um, make sure that the safety of the reactor is maintained. Is this, is this a strategic play? I mean, what, what would happen if they, if they would shut this down? Is that something they would do? Well, these uh, six reactors um, supply about 25 percent of Ukraine's electricity. So I do think it was a well-planned uh, strategic um, attack by the Russian military, although I don't think they thought it through uh, very far. Um, it's not clear, will they, will they uh, completely shut it down to deny uh, Ukraine um, a major source of electricity? But it, it you don't just shut off a, a nuclear plant just uh, like a light bulb. Uh, it takes um, at least a week to do it safely, and you have to maintain the uh, flow of the, the coolant. Um, and if you lose power, I mean, that's what caused the Fukushima disaster, was when they lost power to the cooling systems. They do have backup generators right. that are it would almost be more dangerous to turn it off. It would almost be more dangerous to turn it off than to keep it running. Finally, I, you don't have to be a nuclear physicist to understand why this was such a big deal, you know, combat happening outside of a nuclear power plant. How bad could this have been? Well, it's absolutely reckless, and it could have been very bad. And, of course, the prevailing winds go towards Russia. Uh, had there been some type of a meltdown uh, and, and large radiation release? And this hasn't happened, but there are other uh, nuclear reactors around Ukraine, uh, not all of them as safe as this one. So it was a reckless, really um, incredible uh, uh, act of war. Andrew Weber, we thank you. Tonight, we're also following those making it to relative safety in western Ukraine, if you can even call it that, and across the border, including an unprecedented number of children, plus a look inside tonight at a shelter housing orphans who are fleeing the violence without a family. Tonight, in the bitter cold, with the snow falling, the great escape rolls on. And when Ukrainians reach refugee camps like this one in Romania, the great shock settles in. When I tell my mom that I will go to save my life, mom was crying and tell me that, that maybe she never see me again. It was, it was most scary words which I heard in my life. We're now learning an unprecedented half a million children have fled Ukraine in just the last week. In refugee camps across Eastern Europe, the adults try to create small moments of normalcy, handing out bubbles and celebrating birthdays. I hope we will win soon. The war will end and we come home again. Some have to stay in Ukraine for now. These children are living at a specialized school in Lviv, in western Ukraine. There are 80 of them, orphans, who were evacuated from the east when their towns were bombed by the Russians. Who called you to tell you we have the orphans coming? Uh, the, the teachers from uh, those regions uh, called me to, uh, ta to take these uh, children. So Lviv did. The children are not only being fed, they're also being taught. What's it like to know that these orphans had to be taken out of a, of a war zone? It's something like, uh, it's very painful and hard, but we know the children are our future, and we try to think positive. Children like eight-year-old um, Demetrius. What do you want uh, the world to know about Ukraine? No, shop, uh, no. Demetrius tells me he wants the war to stop so that he can go back home. He's hoping to be adopted. Anything you want to say to anybody, any of your friends back in, in that other region? Demetrius's answer is soul crushing. I want them to stay alive, not to die. As for the people of Lviv, the ones helping him, he says thank you.
For now, all those orphans are being housed. As you saw there, they're being fed, they're being taken care of. They're also going to school because the staff there wants to make sure things are as normal as can be. I did ask them what happens if the fighting moves west. They said if the children are ever at risk, they will evacuate them. Here we turn now to Washington. President Biden under growing pressure as he faces calls from both Democrats and Republicans to ban Russian oil imports. Lawmakers desperately trying to find a way to stop Putin's escalating invasion in Ukraine, while the administration toes the line between supporting the country and avoiding direct participation in the war. Kelly O joins us now from the White House tonight. Kelly, the Biden administration already levying numerous sanctions against, sanctions against Russia and today continuing those diplomatic talks with the country's neighbors. President Biden speaking with Poland's president and Finland's leaders, but both sides of the aisle saying it's not enough that the president needs to target those Russian oil sales. Where do things stand tonight? Well, part of what really stands out is that you have both Democrats and Republicans on the Senate side as well as the House side in great numbers urging the White House to take these steps to ban the importation of Russian petroleum, oil, liquid natural, uh, natural gas, the kind of products that are really uh, the treasure chest for Vladimir Putin, what he can use to finance this war. And what the White House and the administration are saying is they are now looking at different options where they could curtail the import of some products. We don't know exactly how they would do that, but what was noticeable today is that one of the president's top economic advisors said they are considering options to cut off some of the importation of Russian oil products. And that would have potentially a pain for Vladimir Putin, like the other financial uh, kinds of penalties and sanctions we've seen. But what they're trying to avoid is having instability in the global energy market and causing an increase in prices at the pump at a time when many Americans already know it's costing them more to fill up. So they're trying to find that balance. There's a lot of political pressure to do more, and they're trying to find a way to look for some kind of sanction, some kind of ban that would punish Vladimir Putin, but not punish the American driver. Tom? Kelly, you know, I want to play you something South Carolina Senator Lindsey Graham said that has drawn widespread condemnation. Let's take a listen. The only way this ends, my friend, is for somebody in Russia to take this guy out. You would be doing your country a great service and the world a great service. Kelly, Kelly, what was the White House reaction to that? Well, uh, the White House was asked about this today, and Lindsey Graham was sort of voicing this primal vengeance, this idea of Russians perhaps assassinating their own leader as a way to end this war because of the singular power that Vladimir Putin has. The White House made it clear that is not the policy of the United States. Advocating for uh, an assassination of a head of state is not the U.S. policy, and it is not the policy of the Biden administration to even seek regime change in this war. They are open to diplomacy, working with the Russian government, and so they wanted to tamp that down. Uh, Lindsey Graham has a long history with foreign policy and has been a hawk in many ways. But that comment got a lot of people uh, reacting that that could be volatile and provocative at a time when they're trying to keep things from getting worse. Tom? Kelly O'Donnell, live for us from the White House tonight. Kelly, we thank you for that. I want to get right to Ambassador Michael McFaul because there's been so many developments. He's an NBC News national security and international affairs analyst and a former U.S. ambassador to Russia under President Obama. Ambassador, you know, we're one week into this invasion, and you tweeted last night, quote, it is not rational to bomb nuclear power plants. It is insane. Do you think there's anyone inside the Kremlin wondering how to talk Putin down? They're definitely wondering it, Tom. Uh, I bet you every single person in the Kremlin is wondering it. But whether they have the courage to do so is a different matter. Um, you know, General Gerasimov, for instance, his top general, uh, his minister of defense, Sergei Shoigu, uh, when they received the orders to put on alert, a higher level of alert, nuclear forces. I watched the clip of that. And when they said yes to do that, they used one word to say yes. Neither of them looked enthusiastic to do that. You know, my sense of the debate amongst elites and watching and reading as I do other things inside Russia, uh, as well as the, the incredibly brave, mostly young uh, Russians that are protesting against uh, Putin on the streets is that there's nobody that supports this war. Uh, Vladimir Putin, 
uh, started it alone. It seems like he's the only one that wants to keep it going. You know, maybe one or two of his old KGB guys, you know, that had supported. But the the, the vast elite, uh, they don't understand what is going on. And as you know, what they especially don't understand, they don't understand what is the end game. What is he going to do if he actually? gets all the way to Kiev or Kharkiv. Uh, and let's say Zelensky has to flee or they they, they, they they capture him. What then? Are they are they going to occupy the entire country, including where you're at, uh, forever? Uh, Russia doesn't have the resources to do that. And the army doesn't have the will to do that. And the Ukrainians have the will to fight that kind of operation forever. And that is a question you hear a lot in my circles in Russia. What is the end game to this crazy war? I can tell you they definitely have the will here in Ukraine to keep fighting. I want to go to your, your latest op-ed in The Washington Post because you wrote something that I found really interesting because I've been following some of the, the tweets you've put out and some of your thinking. Let's put up this quote on the, on the screen right now. You write, Biden must signal to Putin, again privately, that the United States and the West would be prepared to relax sanctions if Putin withdraws his soldiers from Ukraine. If Putin continues his slaughter of innocent civilians or arrests and kills President Vladimir Zelensky and his government, this offer ought to be withdrawn. But today, Putin should be offered a way out of the corner in which he has trapped himself. So, Ambassador McFaul, I know your backbone is diplomacy, and, and you've written this in The Washington Post. So, so I'm going to think that you do believe this. But, but I'm surprised. Do you, do you honestly think there is still hope to give Putin an off-ramp? There's a difference between uh, policy advocacy and then being an analyst, right? Uh, if, you, if I put on my analyst hat, I think the probability is extremely low. Uh, that's what I would say. And uh, I don't know of anybody that uh, watches and thinks about Putin that thinks he wants that. But as uh, if I'm a policymaker, and I'm, I'm, I'm writing that to American policymakers, uh, even if the probability is 2%, you got to do everything you can to make it 2.5%. Because the consequences of, of, of this war continuing will mean tens of thousands of people will die, including some of my friends where you are right now, including my friends in Kiev and Kharkiv. So I think you have to consider, you have to put that on the table, make that an option, and, and put it in front of other Russians to see that maybe think, well, maybe Putin might not do it, but it's time for us to talk to him or maybe it's time for us to talk on behalf of our country to take this option uh, if, he, if he would not. Finally, uh, Ambassador McFaul, you're somebody a lot of people in the States and across the world are listening to when it comes to this invasion. What, is the thi what has been the, the single thing that has surprised you the most about the last seven days? Well, the obvious thing is the incredible bravery of the Ukrainian people. Uh, I have, we run, a, I'm a teacher at Stanford. We run a big training program of Ukrainians. We've had about 300 through our programs. Uh, I hosted President Zelensky here in August. Uh, I had s him for several hours on our campus. Um, and never in a million years, I thought he was very engaging, smart, but there's lots of policy debates. You know well, uh, it's rough and tumble politics in Ukraine because it's a democracy. And yet I am just incredibly in awe of President Zelensky and what he has done to inspire all kinds of Ukrainians to fight. I'm also, in, uh, I, I also appreciate the heroism of those Russians that are still being arrested, those Russians that are still saying, we don't want this war. Both of those things were surprising to me and give me hope that there may be a way to end this war and maybe a way to, to push back on the Putin regime. On that point, before you go, you know, today Russia blocked access to Facebook, Twitter, and passed a law that seems to criminalize the practice of journalism, causing the BBC to shut down operations, CNN as well. Are we entering into a new dangerous phase within Russia itself? Oh, absolutely. This is shocking. Uh, absolutely shocking. That law, 15 years in jail for talking about the war 
um, shutting down Facebook and Twitter, all other uh, news. You, 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 by those laws, you have to protect your people. You have to get them out. He also shut down Doge TV. Um, he also shut that, which is an opposite, not opposition, but independent television station. He shut down the iconic Echo Moscovy, the radio station that's been around for 20 years, the most trusted source of news for, for millions of people in Russia. Um, and this is a really dark time. It feels like Putin is moving his country towards a kind of North Korean totalitarian regime. Uh, I've never seen anything like it. Uh, he promised Russia when he became president in 2000 that he would do what he can to make uh, Russia like the rich Portugal. He said that in 2000. And what he's really doing in the last 10 days is moving Russia towards North Korea. Another dangerous turn in this war. Ambassador McFaul, we thank you for your time and Always appreciate you here on Top Story. I'll be back later in the broadcast with more from Ukraine, including my interview with a member of Ukraine's parliament who is very close to the president here. But for now, we turn to Gabe Gutierrez in New York with more from Top Story. Tom, thanks so much. Still ahead on this Friday night, fake kidnapping arrest. The mother accused of staging her own disappearance, then telling police she was held captive. Our authorities say she tried to pull the scheme off. Plus, the moment the floor of a home collapsed at a house party with more than 100 teenagers. The search for anyone stuck under the rubble. And the teenager now arrested and charged after he was caught on camera slapping a student. Stay with us. We're back now with a story about a California mother who claimed she was kidnapped and then was found branded and chained along a highway five years ago on Thanksgiving. Now she's been arrested and charged with fraud. Investigators say she faked all of it to escape with an ex-boyfriend. Gotti Schwartz has covered the saga from day one, and he has the latest. It was a story that felt almost too bizarre to believe. A young mother seemingly kidnapped in broad daylight at gunpoint by two strange women, held for over three weeks, then still in chains, mysteriously released right before Thanksgiving dinner. At the time, her husband only speaking to ABC, telling them she was tortured. The bruises were just intense. The bumps from, you know, being hit and kicked and whatever else. But now investigators say Sherry Papini made the whole thing up, convincing an ex-boyfriend to take her to Southern California. And according to the criminal complaint, her ex-boyfriend said those injuries came from hitting herself to create bruises and burning herself on her arms. At one point, even allegedly asking her ex to give her a bruise by slapping a hockey puck at her, telling him, bank a puck off my leg, then telling him to go to Hobby Lobby to buy a wood-burning tool and brand her, which he did, telling investigators Papini never really complained about the pain. Investigators say the ex-boyfriend went along with Papini's requests because she convinced him she was being abused by her husband and thought he was helping a friend and drove her back to Northern California when she said she wanted to go home because she missed her kids. Investigators say when they spoke to others who knew Papini, they found a history of lies and deceit. Since her disappearance, she allegedly collected around $50,000 in a GoFundMe set up in her name and another $30,000 from a California Victims Fund. Investigators say when she was confronted with phone records, evidence, and her ex-boyfriend's confession, she continued to stick to her story about being kidnapped. Papini is now in jail, charged with lying to investigators and mail fraud, awaiting a judge to hear her case. And Gotti Schwartz joins us now from Los Angeles. So, Gotti, investigators confronted Papini more than a year ago with this evidence. So what took so long to arrest her? Yeah, Gabe, that is a really good question. And a big piece of evidence was DNA from an unknown male found on Papini's clothing that investigators matched when they collected an iced tea bottle that they found in the ex-boyfriend's trash can. Once they had that, they confronted the boyfriend, uh, ex-boyfriend. He told them everything, and then they confronted Sherry Papini. But again, Gabe, all that happened in 2000, uh, 2020, and no word on why it took so long to make the arrest. And really Gabe. quickly, Gotti, has her family commented on the arrest? Yeah, the family has commented. They took issue uh, with the way that they called a dramatic way that she was arrested in front of her kids. They also were confused about the charges. Meanwhile, uh, she just made her first appearance in front of a judge. Her lawyer asked that she be released on bail, but prosecutors said she was a flight risk. Uh, so the judge decided that she should remain locked up until at least her next hearing, which is next week.
David. Gotti, thank you. Turning now to a disturbing encounter caught on camera in Indiana. A teacher hitting a student, allegedly over that student wearing a hoodie in school. The teacher is now facing a preliminary charge of battery. Priscilla Thompson reports. Tonight, a teacher in Indiana arrested on a preliminary charge of battery after slapping a student. Surveillance video released by Balgo Community Schools appears to show a student in a hoodie walking down a hallway at Jimtown High School in Elkhart, Indiana last Friday. Moments later, a male teacher is seen chasing after him. Upon reaching the student, the teacher appears to grab him by the backpack. Then this, an open-handed slap, the school district says, the student's head appearing to ricochet off the wall. The teacher appears to grab the student by the arms before yanking him down the hall. Within seconds, the student seemingly collapses on the ground, the teacher walking away as others attend to the student. In a release, Balgo Community Schools says the student suffered visible injuries and was treated by medical staff. We're unaware of what happened before the recording. The district writing, any action that threatens to harm any student will be quickly, directly, and severely addressed. The student involved in the incident is not being identified publicly by the school. Police have now arrested the teacher, 61-year-old Mike Kozinski, on a felony charge of battery. It's a range of six months to two and a half years and a penalty of up to $10,000. The school district says Hosinski was confronting the student about his hoodie. No audio can be heard on the surveillance video, and NBC was unable to reach Hosinski for comment. He retired within hours of the incident, according to the district. His retirement, originally set for June, was approved by the school board Monday night, a quicker resolution than terminating him, according to a source familiar with the board's decision. Before video of the confrontation was released, many in the community rallied around the 2020 Teacher of the Year. Dozens of students at Jimtown High School staged a walkout in support of the teacher, and more than 1,300 people signed a change.org petition aimed at saving Hosinski's tenure and retirement. The district says they have reported the incident to the Department of Child Services, which declined to comment due to state confidentiality laws. And Priscilla Thompson joins us now in studio. Now, Priscilla, you mentioned in your story that the school board allowed the teacher to retire early with a full benefits package, but we're being told that he would have gotten his pension anyway if he were fired. Walk me through that. Right. So a source familiar with the school board's decision says that even if he had been fired, he still would have gotten his pension per Indiana law. And in fact, if they had fired him, that source says they would have had to put him on administrative leave and continue to pay him during what could have been a months-long investigation, and ultimately he probably still would have received that pension. Now to Top Stories news feed. We begin with the shooting at a Kansas high school. Police say a student shot an administrator and a school resource officer outside Kansas City. The suspect was also shot and is in police custody at the hospital. All three people are expected to survive. The FBI is now investigating. A criminal investigation is underway after a floor collapsed during a house party in Colorado. Videos circulating on social media captured the moment the floor gave way while holding dozens of people. Police released body camera footage showing officers searching the basement for anyone trapped under the rubble. At least three people were injured, one seriously. The homeowners told police they were hosting an 18th birthday party for their grandson. And tonight, we're getting an inside look at the Trump White House through the eyes of former Attorney General William Barr. Our Lester Holt sat with him for an exclusive interview to talk about his new memoir, where he offers insight into the Black Lives Matter movement, systemic racism, and the George Floyd protests. In spring 2020, Americans took to the streets, protesting the death of George Floyd, who was killed by Minneapolis police officers. Can we talk about the big lie? Which one is that? Well, you write about uh, <laughs> the, the big lie being Black Lives Matter. Yeah. What did you mean by that? Black Lives Matter is based on the premise that the main threat to black welfare in the inner city are an out-of-control police force that gratuitously kill uh, African Americans. And I, that's simply not borne out by the facts. In society, do you believe there's such a thing as systemic racism? I actually think the whole idea is a cop-out. I think racism exists in people's individuals' souls. 
by dismissing systematic racism, are you not dismissing the pain of African American families that have to sit down with their children and have the talk because they're afraid a simple traffic stop could lead to their death? No, I don't. I, you know, I don't. I don't. What did you say? I don't ignore that. Uh, that dismiss, dismiss was the term yeah, I used. Yeah. I, I, I don't dismiss that as a reality. I don't think the police are racist, and as a general matter, you don't see bias in police. No, and, and every in every study of the situation that I'm familiar with says there is no bias. The numbers are are um, the product of the number of interactions police have. So. Yeah, and black men are the subject of three times as many uh, traffic stops by police. Right, and 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 and. Uh, that sometimes is a function of where the police are. Police go where the crime is. We are the voice of the voiceless! As the racial justice protests grew, some turned violent near the White House. Barr was at President Trump's side when it came to a head on June 1st. I am your president of law and order. As Trump spoke in the Rose Garden, police and riot gear forcefully dispersed the group of largely peaceful protesters nearby in Lafayette Square Park. And then 20 minutes later, there was the president walking across the street to St. John's Church with his top officials, including Barr, in tow. Had you been made aware that you would be a part of it? Not until uh, I arrived in the White House. You were asked to specifically join him? Yes. They told us that he was going to walk 15 feet in front and we were going to trail behind. And then I said, this is not going to go over well. That's what I was thinking. Hey, Bible. Was Lafayette Square cleared for the benefit of the president staging a photo op? No, it, it, it was being cleared for law enforcement purposes. The perception, of course, was that it was cleared to allow the photo app to take place. But that's not really what happened. No, it happened, yeah. but by that point, that became the sure. headline. Sure. In his new memoir, Barr admits it was a headline that did not look good for anyone involved. Were you embarrassed? Were the others embarrassed? Yes. You didn't want to be there. Right. And you can watch more of Lester's conversation with Barr on a special hour this Sunday at 9 Eastern, 8 Central. Switching gears now, if it's Friday night, you know, it is Dateline, and this week the case of snake breeder Ben Rennick found dead. Authorities first turned their focus on Ben's missing snake, but their investigation unveiled a much more sinister story. Here's Dateline's Andrea Cannon. Dee and her partner flew down the dusty driveway toward the property, a 72-acre farm with several homes and buildings. You arrive on the scene, lights are flashing, you guys are in a huge hurry. What do you see as you're pulling up? multiple deputies out, guns drawn, ready to go into this building, but they're still afraid to go in because they think there's a 600 pound snake on the loose. Deputies from the Montgomery County Sheriff's Department had arrived there first. Their body cameras rolled. You're a big old snake on the loose. Yeah, I'm not good with that. I'm not scared of snakes, but I'm scared of this one. The deputies located the victim's wife who had called 911. The whole building full of snakes. I understand you have an anaconda. Where's it, where's it at? I know it's difficult right now, but we need to make sure nobody else gets hurt. It's down in the basement. And I was not aware it was a snake facility, but my partner was because he was local to the area. Some of the deputies also knew this farm was home to more than 2,000 snakes housed in a facility on the property. And they knew who it belonged to, Ben Rennick, a world-renowned snake breeder. So. I learn it's a snake farm, and here's all of these country guys that are terrified of snakes. I had been raised with a snake. I wasn't afraid of a snake. So they've all got out shotguns, and they're ready to just start blasting at a snake if it comes at them. I'm like, come on, guys. The police. Yes, the police. It's a 600-pound snake. You're going to see it coming. So Dee went inside, only to find she was too late. It was obvious he was gone. There was no helping Ben Rennick. <laughs> well, that is a whole lot of snakes. And Dateline's Andrea Canning joins us now. Andrea, you left us on quite the cliffhanger there. How did authorities begin to figure out what happened to Ben? 
it, it took them a while. Um, you know, they had a number of people to look at. Uh, his brother was a potential suspect. They had been fighting um, before the murder. Um, they also had to look at possible rivals in, in the snake industry um, that maybe had a beef with Ben. So, you know, this this went on for months where they, they really didn't have anyone. Then, and it took somebody, uh, a very interesting character coming forward to get the ball rolling on making an arrest in this case. And is it true that at one point the anaconda was the prime suspect? Yes, indeed. The anaconda was the prime suspect. On the 911 call, you can hear her, you know, hear the voice saying um, that they thought he had been killed by a snake. And when the deputies arrived uh, and the paramedics, it was, uh, there's a snake on the loose. And, and these seasoned uh, law enforcement officials were actually pretty scared. Andrea, thank you. And you can catch more of that Dateline episode tonight at 9 p.m. Eastern on NBC. Coming up, our coverage from Ukraine continues. Tom talks with a member of Ukraine's parliament what he says about life inside Kyiv. And you are listening there to the Ukrainian parliament singing the national anthem together as the Russians continue to lay siege in the capital city of Kyiv. Earlier today, I spoke with one of those members of parliament, Igor Chernov, about what life is like inside the besieged capital, his country's wartime needs from the West, and his thoughts on the incredible courage his people have shown. Igor, describe to me life in Kyiv right now. Um... Well, situation is quite difficult because uh, around the city we have a lot of Russia, uh, Russian troops. However, in Kiev is uh, all, all uh, under control, um, under control of Ukrainian army and Ukrainian government. Uh, people are ready to fight. Uh, the motivation and the national spirit on the highest level, I think. So um, we will fight for our city. We will fight for our capital and for, for our country and for our future, actually. Igor, I know your, your specialty is in computers and the digital space. What has it been like to take on Russia when it comes to cyber warfare? Um, well, they tried in, in, in just in a few days and in, uh, in the beginning of um, war, they tried to make a DDoS uh, attack to our financial sector, uh, but we managed with this. Uh, they didn't achieve their goals to steal our data or to broke our uh, websites. Uh, so right now we are quite good in the country, in the um, uh, protection of our um, our websites and our di digital infrastructure. What does Ukraine need most from the world right now? Um, well, um, as you maybe know, the most, uh, the, the prob problem number one is um, missile attacks and bombing from the Russia side. Because um, this is the most dangerous and destroyed um, weapon that they have. Um, they use it against not only the uh, Ukrainian army, but also against civilians. So we need your support how to counter attack of this, uh, how to shoot uh, these missiles. And uh, well, we ask to, to, to establish the no-fly zone over Ukraine. And, yeah, I know that um, NATO countries don't want to, to do this because they uh, consider it like uh, clashes between U.S. pilots and um, Russian Federation pilots. But, okay, we can do this by our uh, own uh, aircraft. I mean, we can fight against aircrafts of Russian Federation. We have pilot, but we need more fighter aircrafts. We need your support on how to um, reflect and or shoot these missiles. 
Igor, I know you're very close to President Zelensky. What can you tell us about the man who is now leading your country during this war? Well, President Zelensky, you know, um, I think he, he became a true leader of nation. He has the support of more than 90% of uh, our nation. This is an example for us how to be brave for our army, for our nation, for our territorial defense units, and I think not only for Ukrainians, but uh, to the whole world. Igor Chernov from Ukraine's parliament joining us tonight here on Top Story. Igor, we thank you for your time. Please stay safe. Coming up, the images from this week leaving a mark on the world. The families forced to separate in Ukraine, but the acts of kindness, big and small, that we saw that brought some light to this darkness. Stay with us. <laughs> Top Story is back live from Ukraine. These stunning scenes playing out across Europe. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky addressing massive crowds via live stream in the Czech Republic, France, Germany, and Georgia. Zelensky urging all Europeans to not remain silent, to not turn a blind eye. So many on the continent rallying behind the people of Ukraine from big demonstrations to small acts of kindness. Strangers in Germany and Poland opening their doors and their hearts to refugees. Others offering just a hug or a song. NBC's Cal Perry is here in Lviv tonight with more on the growing outpouring of support. They're the kinds of images that will stick with the world long after this war is over. Young children and their families packing trains desperate to escape the violence, their hands pressed to the glass for a final goodbye, leaving behind husbands, sons, and brothers staying to fight for Ukraine. Many scrambling to get on trains out of Kyiv, others like Elena leaving by car. We heard all the shootings. We saw the uh, fireworks. I don't know how to call them. And uh, um, so for 48 hours, we were on the go, on the road, no sleep, uh, very little food. Her family trapped in traffic near Kyiv as sirens blared around them. And I just told my husband, like, just cover him with your body. Talking about my son, I said, just cover him with your body. Elena making it safely to Lviv in the West. A million more leaving Ukraine entirely. For some, the journey to safety ends in neighboring Poland. Where amid the chaos and confusion, pianist David Martello offers a moment of peace with his music. Even lending his piano to a Ukrainian refugee, marking the end of her three-day sleepless journey with We Are the Champions. Others arriving in Berlin. Some greeted with hugs and tears, reunited with loved ones. But so many others finding themselves in an unfamiliar country with no family, no support system, and nowhere to go. We have no stuff, we have no money, we have no anything now. And so the people of Germany are answering the call, turning up day after day at train stations and bus stops, donating diapers, clothing, even stuffed animals. Others providing a place to stay, holding signs offering four weeks for two adults. This one using stick figures to illustrate how much room they have to spare. There is like thousands of people from Berlin offering place to stay. This is absolutely incredible. They have like a saying in the paper in Ukrainian, in English, in Russian, amazing. For these refugees at the end of a long and perilous journey, unsure when they'll be able to return home, the acts of kindness, both small and large, from strangers giving them, finally, a reason to smile. Cal Perry, NBC News, Lviv, Ukraine. We thank Cal for that story. We thank you for watching Top Story tonight. I'm Tom Yamas reporting from Ukraine. Stay right there. More news now on the way. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.